All right, we are in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll read the passage together and then break it down and see what the Lord has to say. Uh, I would recommend, um, as I normally do, with passages like this, that you fasten your seatbelts, so to speak. Um, this is some heavy stuff. As, you know, 2 Timothy has been quite heavy, hasn't it? It's not a, neither has Romans, by the way, been light. Uh, we've, been, we've been going through some really, really purifying, church-cleansing, purifying, confrontational verses of Scripture. And praise the Lord for that. All right, let's read. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of... Um, <laughs> contact made. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep in into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning, yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. In this very important scripture verse that I happen to love very much, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. The first verse sets the tone for the whole chapter. But know this, that in the last times, in the last days, perilous times, perilous times will come. And so obviously if you're reading this, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I believe in terms of whether or not we are living in these last days. And I don't know that really any of us would, would really uh, disagree with the statement that it's very likely we are living in the last days. It just seems like so many things are, being, are happening around us that fit the biblical definition. Now, people have said that. In the last 2,000 years in, in the history of the church, people have said that at, at different times. But if you do a study and you look at those times and the things that they thought were last days type prophetic events, it's literally it's nothing compared to the days that we're living in right now. You look at Ezekiel, Gog, Magog, and Persia, and you look at, uh, you look at China, and all the prophecies concerning these nations and what things they might do. And how we previously thought to ourselves, how is it that these countries would have any interest whatsoever in coming anywhere near Israel and attacking Israel? And now all that is so lined up, it's not even funny. It really is. And we see clearly in, in the world a lot of, uh, a lot of um, apostasy, you know, a, lot of, a lot of departure from sincere Christianity, a, a form of godliness without true repentance and the power of the, of the gospel really lived out in people's lives. 
If you want to call that the great apostasy, I'm okay with that. I think I can, I'm down with that. So whether or not we're living in the last days, I'm fairly convinced we are living in the last days. I literally believe that Jesus could take us from this earth at any moment. Those of us, if we are saved, he could take us in the rapture at any moment. I'm, I'm pre-tribulational in my uh, eschatology. I believe that uh, Jesus will take the church home with him before the rapture. But, you know, I really sincerely believe we're living in the last days. I think literally the Lord could come home for, for the church any time. And I do believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. I think the Lord will take the church home. Now, um, let me just explain this briefly. I think the event, the prophetic event, we call the rapture. Uh, I believe that that event and the event we call the tribulation are, in fact, the same event. I think the rapture happens in a fraction of a second. And the tribulation happens, unfolds over a period of seven years. I think they're part of the same event. And I think that the, tribula or the rapture happens at the same time as the tribulation begins. And that way, neither of them comes before one another, which solves the problem of, uh, you know, that whole idea where, you know, one can't foreshadow another because they're both spoken of as imminent in terms of prophetic uh, scripture verses that talk about these events. There's nothing to foreshadow either of them. So how can that be? If one happens, it's a foreshadow of the other, right? The only explanation is that they're, they're in fact the same event and they both begin at the same time. And so I, I, these are my convictions. But then the question, if we, if we all agree, which I would say we probably most agree, and it's possible all, I don't know, in this room, that we are living in the last days, then, what, then the natural question with verse 1 is what are perilous times. What does that mean? What is, he, what is perilous times? Well, he, that's what he continues to define as he goes further. Now, we're talking about uh, the furthest or the final eschateus, uh, horrible, uh, um, you know, um, ex, um, horrible way to say that word. I'm sorry. I apologize. But that is where we get the word eschatology, and literally it's talking about the furthest or the final days of this dispensation that we live in now, during the days approaching the end. And so what are perilous times? Dangerous things going on on earth from the point of view of Christianity and the gospel, not from the point of view of worldliness. Listen, when we read verse 1, know this in the last days, perilous times will come, we automatically in our flesh think perilous times has to do with the world and human experience. No, it's spiritual stuff. It's perilous times. It's perilous for your faith. It's perilous for Christianity. And it's also then also perilous concerning the prophecies being fulfilled on earth uh, at the same time. Paul's concerned with the body of Christ, not the world, not personal property, not health, not wealth, which, you know, so many prosperity gospel people are more concerned with, the health and wealthers, right? Um, not even the danger. He's not even concerned with danger in the world. Because you know what? If you're securing Christ, if you truly are securing Christ, no matter how perilous it gets, the Lord is faithful. He's going he's gonna to deliver you. You just have to make sure you're securing Christ. How do you know that you have absolute confidence in your salvation when you're abiding in Christ, truly abiding in Christ? So what are perilous times? Verse 2 begins his explanation or exposition definitions of what perilous times look like. So when you read this, you think about this, and you think about yourself, and you think about others around you, and you say, am I these things, or are others around me these things? Well, they will be lovers of themselves, lovers of themselves. You guys hear me, I'm often very critical of uh, this belief in, in self, you know, and the popularity of self-help books and uh, self-esteem thinking. Uh, this stuff, it's crept into the church. I mean, where people, I hear people say to each other, uh, say, say to each other, you know, oh, you can do this. You're going to be okay. You've got, you know, you're, you're so great. You're this. And they're trying to build people's self-esteem all the time. This is something, it's permeated our culture. It's been popularized in psychology. It's been popularized in book form, it's, listen, this kind of stuff, it's, you want to make money? Write a self-help book that builds people's self-esteem. It'll sell. Well, most of you probably could, no, maybe, maybe a few of you could, well, maybe one or two of you, sorry. Um, 
That's a formula. That's what I'm trying to, that's a formula for success in a self-help book. Build people up in, the, in believing in themselves and they'll buy your book. I'm, I'm serious. You just go and flip through a few of them in, in Barnes and Noble or whatever bookstore you go to or on the internet. That's the subject matter of almost every single one of them. It really is. And so lovers of themselves, what is the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of that would be haters of self, right? If you were just to take it literally. Now, I know we don't want to be literally haters of all that we are because Christ, if he has put his Holy Spirit in us and if, if, he has, if we're saved and our spirit and our soul are saved and going to heaven, two-thirds of us has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, right? And so if that's the case, we need to be not haters of that part of us, but haters of one-third of us, and that is our flesh. Romans chapter 7, couldn't be more clear. We even know exactly what part of ourselves to hate. God tells us it's very clear. This is not like God just hopes that we figure, figure it out, you know? He's, he's said it. He's made this so clear. Hate your flesh. Some of you are thinking, I do that every day. I look in the mirror, I go, I hate you. Well, maybe I'm just speaking to myself. I don't know. Or you get up and you go, ow, oh, I hate this flesh. Well, I'm 52, so I certainly feel that stuff every day. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the part when, when those thoughts pop into your head, those evil thoughts, those selfish thoughts, lustful self-serving, offended at your spouse, offended at your boss, feeling like someone's ripping you off, um, feeling like someone's got in front of you and they're going five miles an hour but below the speed limit and you're like, Arr! it's some personal frustration, we're sorry. Lovers of themselves, as if I have a right, as if, as if I have some rights, you know? You know what? The Bible is not real concerned. You can read it for yourself. It's not real concerned with establishing your rights. You look throughout the Bible, there's really, it's not a lot of places where God tells you all that you have a right to. And I'm speaking about as a human being, apart from the rights that you have in Christ. What are your rights? You have earned the right to spend eternity in hell apart from God. That's about it. That's what your right is. You have a right to that. You've earned that. You deserve it. So, lovers of themselves, and lovers of money. Well, everything after loving yourself and your own design or ideas for life follows naturally. Well, if you're really into yourself, well, then you want to promote yourself, and you want more of yourself, and so you want money. Uh, 1 Timothy, we studied chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is a root. Don't get this verse wrong, folks. Don't misquote this verse. A lot of people do that. People say the uh, Money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that. Look, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which is absolutely true, for which some have strayed concerning the faith in their greediness, and as a result, they think that they're doing good for themselves, but they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Why? Well, because if money is what you're living for, there's no room to worship God. You can't love, you can't love mammon and God. You'll either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. That's what the Bible says. Check your heart. What are you loving? What are you living for? What are you, what are you living in? What are you angry about? I don't have enough money. Is that what you're angry about? Are you angry at money because you don't have enough and other people do? Or Listen, be content. Be content with what God has given you. And if you've been given much, much is expected. Be faithful. Glorify the Lord with what you have. What does the love of money look like? Does it mean the person has money? Absolutely not. I think people, most people don't, quote, have money in this culture compared to a lot of other people. But if you really start to compare yourself, and this is where it gets embarrassing. You can, those of you in the room today who think, I, I don't have any money, what are you talking about? And you go compare yourself with people living in third world countries, I'd say you better check your thinking. That's stinking thinking. Because there's people that have a lot less than you do. A lot less. And so be faithful with what you have and be thankful for what you have. This is the opposite of those who love money. Being content. 
They also are boasters and they are proud. Self-promotion is an evidence of pride, promoting yourself, advancing yourself. Uh, we, you know, we live in a world with a ladder-climbing mentality. You ever hear that expression? Climbing the ladder of? What is success? Who gets to decide what success is? Well, according to Paul, success is godliness with contentment. That's success. Pleasing God, not yourself. Not worried about yourself. Not worried about what other people think about you. Worried about what God thinks. Worried about what, the, what Moses said. And are you being convicted when you are not living up to those standards? Are you confessing? Are you repenting? Are you turning from sin regularly, completely, fighting, battling against your sin? Or are you a boaster and proud? Are you thinking that you've arrived and you're okay and everything's fine? Maybe you're just going through the motions in your Christianity. And you've arrived at a level of, men love this, cruise control. Men love cruise control. We don't even, forget it. Don't, try, don't show me a car that doesn't have cruise control. I don't want it, man. I don't want to have to work to go 75 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Oh, shoot, 65. I hope nobody's watching, you know? <laughs> um, boaster, a boaster is one who wants people to respect them and promote them. They want to feel admired by others, so they'll, you know, they look for ways. You, boy, I'll tell you what. Say what you want about social media, but you, you really want to get to know what a person's about? <laughs> Check out their page or their tweets or their whatever. You'll learn quickly what they're about, whether they're about, them, they're about themselves or whether they're about self-promotion. Um, people try to cloak it in other things, call it righteousness all the time. They learn behaviors from, pe from church people of how to make it seem like it's one thing, but it's really another. It comes down to your heart, the motives in your heart, self-promotion, self-interest, proud of self, trying to build yourself up. This is why it's so important that you don't build yourself up. You let God do it because then you're built on something solid and true. You're built on humility. You're built on uh, a recognition of how sinful you are and how much you really need God and how thankful you are for everything God has done for you and everything that God has given you. They're also, it goes on to say, blasphemers, blasphemers. Those who speak against God and doctrines of eternal life, gospel truths, the truth of the word, what, the true definitions of what sin is, minimizing or changing the meaning. Remember now, when, when it comes to law, if you know anything about law, you'll hear these words. There's the letter of and the spirit of. You've heard those things about law, I'm sure. Probably you guys have heard those, right? Well, God's not concerned with the letter of. Letters are something he uses to communicate it. He's concerned with the spirit of. And the spirit of the law is the intent of the author of the law. How God intends the law to be understood or applied. That's the spirit of the law. You know, given by the Spirit of God through men to, to hum mankind. You want to make sure that you're not a blasphemer? Don't diminish the power and the meaning and the conviction of the truth of the gospel of God. Don't do that. Let, let it have its full force. Yes, this is what it means. Yes, it also means that I fail and I'm a sinner. Yes, I'm a work in progress and, and I'm, you know, I, I'm... I'm broken in, in this area or that. Let it convict you. Let it convict others. Don't try to save people by making them feel better in the face of a very convicting law. Don't do that. Because what God's trying to do is cleanse them and uplift them in forgiveness. Listen, the conscience is, is ready, willing, and able to explain to somebody on the inside what the consequence of sin is, and that, that the fact that somebody is in sin, the conscience is able to do that. Romans 2 very clearly says it. But blasphemers are those who speak against the truths of God, and by doing so, either keep themselves or others from salvation, making themselves feel better about themselves. Disobedient to parents. Disobedient, well, I'm 52, I've, I've finally got this. <laughs> How did I get it? Well, my parents live in Arizona. I call them once a week, and it's hard to disobey someone you just talk to once on the, on the phone once a week. You know what I mean? And they never tell me what to do anymore, so I'm not disobedient to my parents. That, it's become easy. They're too tired to tell me what to do anymore. I've completely worn them out. 
disobedient to parents, does that, um, does that responsibility or accountability, does that leave somehow after you leave the house and you get married? No, it does, never says that. We're obligated as children to submit to our parents unless their, direct, their direction as parents is directing us to disobey God, of course. But as adults, it literally says, honor thy father and thy mother, right? And so we're to obey parents. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 12, clearly from the Ten Commandments, and then Ephesians 6, 2. Now, there are also these people who are perilous times, people who arise in the church during perilous times. They are also unthankful. A lack of gratitude, a lack of contentment and thankfulness for what things we do have is an evidence or, a, or, or the, the evidence of, of someone who is not um, thinking or being content, thinking that they have enough. Their, their, their ingratitude is, is being evident that they're, that they're walking around grumbling and they're unthankful for everything that they do have. I know this is a challenge. Look, it's a, I admit that it's a challenge for me, definitely. Um, but my, you know what, listen, you want to know my, my desires, like in terms my godly desires, I want to see this church succeed. I really do. I want to see you guys walk with the Lord. I want to see you confronting your sinfulness, confessing, repenting, and getting radically changed. I want to see you guys become pastors and plant churches. I want to see you guys lead other people to Christ. I want to see this church successful. I, that's, yeah, but sometimes that's a fleshly thing. You can take godly things and make them fleshly. Did you ever realize that? Godly desires, if they become about you, become sinful. So I have to be content with what God has given me. Now, God's given me a lot. As a pastor, I have an amazing church, people that love each other, people that long suffer with one another and me, and people that want to learn the, the Word of God. I, I'm very... I'm, we're, you know, we're above the average curve, you know? The average church in America is like 100 people, the average church. So we're well above that. The Lord's blessing us. But I, I, listen, I don't want to be content with that in the sense that um, I rest on my laurels and get lazy with it. But I want to be content with it in that this is what God has chosen that we are right now. But we should pray for more. We should pray for more people to get saved, more people that we can disciple but we need to be faithful. We need to be thankful with what we are and what we have. Right, Ziggy? Okay. Unholy, where blasphemers speak against God, unholy acts against God. So acting other than what is glorifying to God, what you know to be right, behaving opposite of that. And, and even doing it, you know, what, even doing good for the wrong reasons is unholy. Again, as we already outlined and just clear, clearly under, uh, defined that. If, you, if you're doing what is right, but you're doing it for yourself, to build yourself up and for people to be impressed with you, it's unholy. It, everything has got to glorify God, right? So unholy. And then unloving, number, verse three, the verse, first word. Um, it's not that they don't love, it's not that they don't love. We, we already, we've already seen how much they will love themselves. So it's not that they don't love at all. It's that what they love is, is sinful in nature. So unloving is, is, a, is a kind of a misdirected affection. I've, I've said this all through Exodus. God is after your heart. Worship keeps you in the light. Worship God, and you'll stay in the light. Worship yourself, and you'll be lovers of darkness and lovers of self and ungodly and boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient to parents and unthankful. It's the object of your affection is what you will worship. You will live for what you love. Do you understand that? So when, when this says these perilous times, there will be people within the congregation that are unloving, it doesn't mean that they don't love something. It means that they love all the wrong things. We got that? Okay. Unforgiving. Uh, holding on to debts against others is not our right. David said, against you and you only have I sinned, which, you know, Uriah's family, I'm sure, would have said, wait a minute, what? He has sinned against us. He killed our dad. He killed our uncle. He killed my son, you know, Uriah the Hittite. So... 
but that debt belongs to the Lord. We don't sin against one another. We sin against God. Uh, we, the consequence of our sins toward one another is, uh, is hurtful. We damage one another, you know, um, but we don't, we sin against God. If, if you belong to, you folks belong to God and I do something bad to you or wrong to you, I'm sinning against God because you're his people. So think about that when, when you manipulate, when you cheat one another, when you uh, hate one another in your heart, when you're angry with each other, you're angry at God, you're, you're cheating God, you're hurting God. You understand that? So uh, unforgiving, you're holding on to something that doesn't belong to you. It's a debt that, that God owns. Now, forgiveness is tricky. I don't know if you ever noticed this before, but it's, it's really hard sometimes to forgive. You ever notice that? So what I've learned is when, when I have felt betrayed or, you know, somehow wronged, um, in the past, I've done things like, you know, set out to pray every day, Lord, um, with, my, with my brain as a choice, I forgive that person. But Lord, I have no control over the emotions. I can't seem to turn those off. And I need your help with those. And we confess that over and over again to the Lord. And we, whenever, when necessary, we confess it to the person we're angry with when, when called for. When not, we don't. We confess it to somebody else. But we bring light into that unforgiveness. We confess it as sin. And we turn from it in repentance, unforgiveness. They're also, by the way, going back to what they say, they are slanderers. And what you say, we all, listen, we covered this again last week, this past weekend. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what things you say is a revelation of what's in your heart. So they're slanderers. Most often exist because people love to make themselves look better or higher by bringing others down. So when they're not around, you say something against or bad them, about them to make yourself look better. That's slander. Or even forget trying to make yourself look better. Just trying to make someone else look bad for whatever reason. It can be true what you're saying. Guess what, folks? It's still slander. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. If you're talking about them and you're not biblically handling what, what you're doing, what their problem is, then you're slandering them. This is, I'll tell you what, one of the biggest problems in the church is the use of the tongue and the way we speak about one another or, or uh, we don't handle things biblically. It is one of the, it's one of the greatest signs of immaturity in Christianity. Uh, the tongue, money, what else? Servanthood in the church. Um, these are all signs of a church that has a lot of immaturity in it, spiritual immaturity, right? Um, slander is malicious and therefore is uh, set on undermining or destroying the other person's reputation, speaking badly against somebody else, right? So then we go, we, continuing here, without, without self-control. Well, naturally, they're going to have no self-control because they don't have the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians 5, 22 through 26. I'll read it for you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then I, I lean towards this explanation. I know people disagree. It looks like just a list of the fruit of the Spirit. But I think the word love is an initial definition of every other word that comes after. I really look at it that way. Now, I'm not going to argue or, you know, what, quibble over it, but it's the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that is joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and there's that two-word phrase, self-control, self-control, a fruit of the Spirit, the ability to have authority or control over your flesh. The, the spirit and the soul subduing the deeds and the lusts of the flesh, the desires of your heart, controlled under the control of the truth of God, surrendered, submitted to the truth of God. When was the last time you confronted yourself about an area of sin that you deal with, that you know you struggle with, seriously confronted yourself about it and gone before the Lord broken over your sinfulness? You know, that, that is self-control. When you take yourself before the Lord and throw yourself on his mercy and say, Lord, I'm sick and tired of this, the 
thinking or this, this thought that's a sin or this action that I'm doing that's a sin or this inaction that I'm doing that's a sin and really sincerely just fed up with your sinfulness. That is the best expression of self-control there is because that's repentance. Turning from your sin, seeking God for forgiveness and doing everything in your ability with without offending the word of God, to overcome your sinfulness. God will provide a means of escape for your sin. He always does, right? It's a matter of whether or not you choose that way of escape. God's laid it out there for you. He has made a way to get you out of your sin. And if you're willing and you really have, if if the fruit of the Spirit is there, you're going to want to turn from your sin. Um, And notice that the attributes of righteousness are directly present because God's Holy Spirit is directly present. Because, as I always say, righteousness is a relational reality. The more time you spend with God, the more his righteousness becomes your reality. That's just the way it works. It's like the married couple. They've been together 50 years. They finish each other's sentences. They start, you, you know, you see one, you automatically, in your mind, you have an image in your mind of what the other one looks like, too. Because you can't disassociate them. They're so closely associated with one another, you know? It's like, it's scary. They're the same person anymore. And that's unity. Peter said in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, 5 through 9, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to, your, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, <clears throat> self-control isn't something you practice once in getting saved, and then you're done. You persevere in self-control. To perseverance, add godliness. To godliness, add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, add love. And that you're all the way back to the word love again. For if these things are yours and abound... You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness. You don't want to be blind in the sense of spiritually blind. Thinking that you're okay with God and find out later that you're not. Don't be there. And they've forgotten that he, this person who is spiritually blind, was cleansed from his old sins. Forgotten. Now, Again, we go back to our passage, and we're still in verse 3. And the next word we see is the word brutal, brutal, capable of inflicting suffering on others without pause, without uh, conviction or, or care, concern. brutal. Just you're able to cause another person hurt, and you don't even feel bad about it. That's brutality. Within the congregation, within the, those that call themselves Christians, they are also then despisers of what is good. <clears throat> which is hard to comprehend when you think that, that verse 5 says they have a form of godliness. Apparently, you can despise of what is good and still have a form of godliness. You understand what I'm saying? Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Call it what it is and let God tell you what it is before you dare open your mouth and try to define it, right? Don't be a despiser of what is good and don't be a lover of what is evil. They are traitors, traitors. Uh, Why? Because they're betraying, verse 4, they're betraying Christ and his gospel. They're traitors to the gospel. They are headstrong, argumentative, unwilling to listen. They're haughty. They won't be told what is right, what is wrong. No conviction comes upon them because they're the ones who are telling you what's right and wrong. And this is, again, these are the extremes. But there is a heart attitude, an unspoken heart attitude that is, I'm not, you might not even say it, but you might be saying, I'm not listening to this. That's haughty. That's headstrong. The Holy Spirit's trying to tell you you're in sin, and you're saying, no, that's Pastor John saying that. That's not the, that's not God, you know. Um, stiff-necked, right? Unteachable and thinking too highly of self. Lovers of pleasure, what you love matters. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You can't, 
be temporally minded, and think that you're eternally secure. Did you hear what I just said? You can't be temporally minded. This, this earth, the way things are, it's not going to keep going. And if we're in the last days, and these are perilous times, it's, it's shorter than you think. So don't invest your hope, your faith, your love, your affection on this, what you have around us today. Don't. The world's going to pass away, and everything in it. God's going to start all over again. Right? Amen? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You have to be eternally affectioned. The, uh, the desires of your heart being trained on eternity rather than on this world. Having then a form of godliness, but in denial of the power of godliness. Wow, what a contradiction in terms that sounds like, doesn't it? How can someone appear godly, a form of godliness, yet deny the power of the gospel within godliness? Well, 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. There, uh, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive her heresies even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Literally people mocking the way of truth, which is the gospel, which is Jesus. He is the way of truth. They'll, they'll be mocking that because you are not living yourself in, in the light of it. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For, as, for a long time, their judgment has, been, uh, has not been idle, and their uh, destruction does not slumber or sleep. So they are those who have a sort of a religious outward appearance. There's an adherence to some religiosity without any real concern or, or conviction about their personal sin. Uh, they, people, listen, people can achieve on their own, in their flesh, a level of apparent righteousness. It can look on the outside like these are people you want to be like. But if inwardly they're not truly saved and there's not true brokenness and humility and repentance, why would you follow them? And how would you know? The only way that you can is follow Jesus. And then you'll know others by their fruit. Eventually, the Lord will reveal it. We have to follow Jesus, not people. Don't follow me. Well, Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. But if anything in me says, I don't think he's following the Lord, then don't follow me. Right? And from such people, turn away. Wait, wait, wait. Don't leave. <laughs> I'm not that bad, right? For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with their sins, led away by various lusts, always learning. And listen, this concept of going into households and leading captive gullible women, so on and so forth. Um, single ladies especially, if you're a single lady in here today, let me just say this. You're vulnerable. You're, a vulner you're vulnerable. Your emotions well, if a guy comes into your household and wants to draw you away, has an appearance of godliness, um, you know, be careful. Amen. Guys, single guys, be careful. Amen. Don't be led away by worldliness and lustful thinking. This stuff is too important, who you uh, yoke yourself to. Be serious. Be sober-minded. Do everything in the light, you know, bring your relationships into the church. If that person doesn't want to come into the church, just that's, we're done. You know, you're not part of the church, you're not part of my life, you know. So watch out for those. Uh, now he actually gives two examples, he says here, but look what it says in verse 7, always learning. Again, religious, have an, an outward appearance of religiosity, and always seem to be gaining in some kind of understanding or learning. They're seeking learning, yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge of the truth? That is bringing themselves into the light and letting the light define them because they're always busy learning something other than the truth. They already know what the truth says. They've flat out rejected it. And so they're learning more ways to define what they believe 
and they keep themselves busy learning other things to keep them from actually having to deal with the fact that they're denying the truth. That's real darkness. There's a lot of people I've seen within the church, call themselves Christians, who live that way. That's scary stuff, right? Janus, Jambres, resisted Moses, not in our lifetime, but we have examples like them today. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproving. This is the last days, perilous times going on in the church. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. They're not approved concerning the faith. They're not acquiring salvation. They're not acquiring sanctification by continuing by grace through faith in the definitions that God has laid out. But verse 9, they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest in the presence of all as God will reveal it. And theirs also was, that is Janus and Jambres, theirs, their progress was uh, withheld from them. I think we should probably stop there. I mean, there's only another six verses, but um, we'll continue with this next week. Uh, well, yeah, I'm here next week, so it's my last week before I go to Ireland. Um, But go ahead and read ahead, consider these things, go back over this message tonight and these verses of Scripture. They're very sobering. Um, You know, bring yourself and your thoughts and your heart before the Lord. When you do devotions, when you do prayer, you know, once a day, just say to the Lord, Lord, I I need to confess, and and I need to be keenly aware of the things that that I need to confess. Uh, Bring conviction into my life. Show me my wickedness. I love Psalm 139 for that reason, because David sincerely, out of the abundance of his heart affections, Lord, search me and know me. Try me. Know my anxieties, my stresses. Anxiety is the opposite of faith. Know the anxieties of my heart. The things that I worry about, I'm not trusting you with, you know. Reveal to me my wickedness, Lord, you know. Show me, Lord, my ways that I might be cleansed in your presence. It's a powerful way to live, but it is the gospel, and it is the truth, and it is what we're required to do as Christians, right? Amen?